But one of the things I, before I continue, I want to uh, welcome the visitors. Thank you for coming. And uh, some of you just came by looking at the sign. So that makes the sign, uh, the amount we paid, uh, worth it. So, <laughs> bro, it's five grand, man. Come on, it must mean something. <laughs> One of the things I want to encourage, first before I go into the word, is for those who are older and you're going through multiple challenges, seeing the doctor, praying, visiting, and every other week you have a testimony of healing, praying through, I want to encourage you, please do not ever be embarrassed to come forward and share your testimony, thinking that, am I a sick bird? What are they going to think? Why am I giving testimonies of healing every week? Don't I believe last week? Didn't I believe? Don't go through that battle in your mind. It was interesting for the little boy to give a testimony that uh, if I die, take me home. I don't think so any older people will dare to say that. <laughs> it's easy to say when you're five. Yeah, it's not going to happen for the next 50, 70, 80 years later. The older you grow, you won't even say, God, <laughs> don't take me home unnoticed, uninformed. You know, please let everybody know. You don't want to be forgotten when you Sleep especially when you're, uh, when you're living on your own. You know, there's nobody who knows what's going on. Are you following? I wanted to encourage you. When you're older, you go through a time and season in your life, you need prayer for healing. You need prayer for mobility. You need God to oil your joints and stuff like that. You need, you need the moral encouragement. You need the strength of your family to be around. You need somebody to tell you, you are okay, don't give up. Keep on going. You, it's just love and encouragement all around you. Are, are you following? And it's okay to say to someone in church, if you need some encouragement, would you encourage me? Don't put on a face that everything is okay with you when you need some love. Is that okay to say that? Sometimes, you know, well, if God is in them, we should know. They should know. If God is in you, you should tell too. We don't have to all the time put you through an x-ray machine and find out what's going on. God doesn't embarrass anybody. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are not there to invade privacy. Because you are hiding intentionally, that's invading. When you're a child of God, you need to open your heart as well when you are speaking to the right person. You see, when you go to the hospital and the doctor asks you what's going on, you have to tell some of your private matters because he's a doctor. Are you with me? You're not going to tell to anybody down the street what's your private matter, what's going on. In the same way in God's presence, and you, you, you build and establish a trust and you know how to open up and say what's going on. So allow the Lord's name to be praised. And uh, I thank the Lord for the testimonies. I wanted to know that we don't put anybody down in testimony. You give silly things, we'll come and tell you something. But when it's a real testimony, it's given to God. And it's a season going through in your life. Please do not be embarrassed. Oh, every week I have to come and uh, tell something about my healing, my bones and my body. What will people say? Nothing. We are looking at you as champions of faith. We are looking at you in a time where you are living out what you preached about all your life. You spoke that God is your healer. Now he's healing it. Are you following? Praise God. Somebody tell your neighbor, I'm so glad to be here on Sunday. Okay? If the other fellow say, I don't think so, punch him straight away, okay? <laughs>
And uh, so I told her not to miss the broadcast this morning. And uh, we are studying in the book of Colossians, and we realize how God's word is the power to apply to every part of our being. Totally different from topical study. Topical means it's a topic. For example, let's say we talk about finance. By the way, our church, we are not against prosperity. It's fun to prosper as long as you know what to do with the money. If you have projects, God will give you the money. Why some churches don't have money? Because they don't have projects. You've got to do something for God for God to prosper you, correct? It's, all, it's not fun when you, when you talk about money and you, you don't know what to do with the money. How you spend it all on your personal thing, okay? Just keep that in mind. It's fun to prosper, but prosper in the right way. Because money comes in the wrong way can kill you. And we all know that. I remember st- uh, reading one very sad uh, testimony. In fact, not testimony. A report in the Singapore newspaper. Um, uh, while I was there, you know, the, 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 the son, uh, 21 years old, he did very well in his university exams and the, comes from a rich family and the father wanted to get him a gift. So brought him to... Um, the car showroom and ask what would you like and he said a Subaru you know Subaru the the highest gig whatever they had with turbo and all that right and uh, father was rich enough to pay cash and you know in Singapore when you say pay cash for a car that's about 150 over thousand dollars for a car that's how it costs in Singapore paid cash and drove the car out Morning he drove out and the night he died. Why? Is that the first car you'll buy for a 21-year-old who have never driven before? There are many times we ask for such things. We like the power. We like the look. We like the ego. And we ask God, say, God, why don't you give me? But God knows he's going to kill you because you're not trained for it. He'll give you when you know how to handle it. How is that? Same goes with power. Faith, the operations of our faith. Our faith has the potent ability to get a million dollars, but what would you do? That's the question. Sometimes we ask God, impress me if you are God, give it to me. He doesn't need to impress you, he's God anyways. He needs to help us build our faith, not impress us. God is real. Somebody say amen. Amen. He doesn't need to do magic to impress us, he's God. Oh God, I've not seen you going to the cross. So if you want me to believe, you show me it again. What? So he shows you visions if you don't believe too bad. He shows you dreams, but if you don't believe God can speak through dreams, too bad. God, I want to see it in the flesh. No, it's not going to happen. It happened 2,000 years ago. Are you following? You see, sometimes we ask for signs to delay our obedience. You don't want to deal with your obedience. You don't want to deal with your disobedience. We, we don't want to deal with our unbelief. So we throw a fleece and throw it back to God. No, if you are God, you show it to me. You don't need to. He is God anyways. Are you following? And so let's mature. So topical means you only handle one topic. But sometimes we go through multiple challenges all at the same time. So when we study God's word as a whole, God is going to, is able to put a buffet right in front of you and minister to you as a whole rather than just one topic at a time. Are you following? And so let's go through the, it's a, the cocktail of God's presence. It's just the way it is. Uh, you know, it, it, multiple challenges, but God's word is able to strengthen us. You say, well, I'm young and I need a house and I need this. I may not need God. But you see, when you have God in the center of your equation, your young, old, intermediate, whatever else you're going through, is going to fix everything. It's not a magic fix. It's a real fix. God doesn't do magic. He's a real God. Amen? Okay. So Colossians chapter 3, we studied from 1, the first part of the uh, chapter. In fact, chapter 3 is really uh, my favorite because of the, it speaks of the mind. I was thinking through which way to tackle this uh, so that it will be applicable and helpful 
Uh, and I managed to only tackle uh, three verses. Uh, as much as I try to put a lot more together, we'll see how it goes. Chapter 3, verse 1, If then you have been raised with Christ. Look at how Paul convinces us. In chapter 1, we talked about the philosophy of universalism and why Jesus is Lord. And then in chapter 2, we went on to establish the fact that we, our hearts needs to be growing together. It, it's a whole package of, like for example, let's say our child is going to school. What would you tell the child and prepare? Ah, everything is going to be okay. No, sometimes not. The parent, the teacher is going to demand homework. He's going to tell you sit up straight and so many other things. And, and so Paul is giving us a Sunday school ride. What it is to go through your new life in the Lord. What to expect. There are old things that's going to come and creep up on you. I want it to be strong and he kind of fixes the source of the problem. And that's what he says. If then you have been with, raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. And verse 2, set your mind, set your minds on things which are where? Above. above and not on things that are on earth. I just want to tackle verse 3, and then we'll stop, we'll talk about other things. For you have died, your life is hidden with Christ in God. I want to let it sink in for a minute. Many times when Christ is being presented to us, we are still finding somehow Jesus to fill in or answer my material needs. I don't know whether sometimes the persuasion of accepting Christ is right or wrong. If you accept Christ, your needs will be met. Your this will be there. Your dog will be healthy. And sometimes when you accept Christ, everything happens opposite. Why? Because God is uprooting things which are not planted by him, planted by the enemy. He's uprooting things which are not supposed to be there. So he does the clean up for us. Are you with me? Which is from the enemy, which is right, God knows. So instead of orderliness, before order, there is always a chaos. And God allows that to happen. And so now Paul, Paul is reminding us, if Christ is in you, the first thing God sets it right in your heart, he makes you heavenly minded. You have been seeking for earthly things all the time. He brings a focus of heaven in your life. You never thought about eternity. Now he brings that scope. You never thought about demons existing. He brings some scope to it. He's also reminding us there is a God in heaven who can help you and lift you up. That is not really the Christian thing. It's a God thing. Amen. You will never know how to appreciate Jesus if you have never been an idol worshiper before. What are the things people do to appease their God? Coming from a Hindu background, man, every year some of my friends, and when I say some, that's only some, but every year it's about 800 over 1,000, uh, 80, 90,000 uh, people in Singapore alone, they will carry cavities or typos, meaning to say 300 over spikes that will go through their body and they will walk for about 4.8 kilometers carrying heavy uh, weight is called cavity. You can check it out on uh, internet, I mean uh, Google. And uh, they'll carry it just to get their sins to be forgiven. Every year after year, some of them will make a vow. If Christ would heal my daughter, my, my, my mother, I will carry this, this um, devotional sacrifice like an ark, if you could say, you know, just for our understanding. Uh, I will carry this for next seven years. They'll make a vow. They'll walk through uh, fireworks where the coals are burning. It's, it, it's a short distance from me, probably from here to there. And they'll walk through. They'll make a vow. How many times my heart has been... See, I, I was there before Christ, but after knowing Christ, I wept if they only knew that Jesus took the cross, that their sins are forgiven. You see, you remembering your sins is different 
whether God forgave or not. He did forgive, but you are remembering. You get to deal with it. But here, their sins are not forgiven. And every year they do penance to get their sins forgiven. If you only knew what Christ has done on the cross for us. You see, Paul is saying, if then you have been raised with Christ and you are sitting there, you got to seek the things that are above. That's the first change that will come. It's a change of eternity. So the first point that I want to uh, encourage us today, honor your new identity. Honor that. Don't treat it like a drive through change. You know, I just drove through McDonald's and I bought this thing and um, I became a Christian yesterday. It's not a drive through change. It may last, it may be the change, what you say out of your mouth probably was five minutes. It was not a ritual. And then probably you took baptism, but that, that's another five minutes or ten minutes, I'm not sure, because if we keep you more than... 30 seconds, you'll die and really see Jesus there, you know. If we keep you underwater, <laughs> probably in and out you go. It, it, it was just a short ritual, but the Bible study was longer. Then the change is longer, then the discipleship is longer. Then you realize you're experiencing the change of Christ a lifetime. It's not a drive through change. So Paul draws people. you got to first seek the things of God because he has set you up there. God is not from the earth or from hell. He's up above in order for you to experience that. you got to set your things from above. Somebody say, Amen. Amen. Everything now has a divine perspective. Where is God in my marriage? Where is God in my children? Where is God when I'm struggling? Where is God when I'm 20? Now, guys, listen, the younger you are, every scope of 10 years bracket, if you can think that way, easier. Where is God in my 20s? What am I going to discover God? You know, when, when, when you're in your 20s, probably you are seeking for, if you're an early parent, you, you'll be asking God to provide your needs, a house, wisdom for children, all is about money and material needs because that's the season of your life. Nothing wrong in that asking, but Paul is trying to emphasize without God, all these things will be a struggle. The more you need God to set your things right and the more you need him to do miracles, then the more you will seek things which are above, you see. It's not asking you to abandon. It's not asking you to choose the cheapest thing if the cheapest thing is of a lousy quality. I want you to know that God is a God of quality. Say amen. amen. Please don't think if you ask God to choose, He will find things, the most cheapest one in Amazon or mid here or mid there. I don't know why people like to make a very funny remark. Ah, oh, it's made in China. In China, you get things according to how much you're willing to pay. You want to pay for $5, you'll get a $5 product. You're willing to pay $1,000, you will get a $1,000 product made in China as well. It's all according to how much you're going to buy. It. Are you following? you got to understand that because you can find things, the most expensive things you made in Pakistan. What? This is $150. Yeah, because the manufacturing company of that company, the manufacturing company is contracted to that country. So you find that in Southeast Asia or in Colombia, in Argentina, in Brazil, in Mexico, they are able to manufacture according to the money you're willing to pay for it. So the fact that we always use the slang word, ah, it's from China, that's not true. Okay? You've got to settle this. If not, it becomes a very derogatory statement. Ah, you know, the, uh, the rednecks. What? Because that's a derogatory statement. Ah, you know, the hillbillies. I, th I tell my friends, don't even say that. They'll shoot you, man. <laughs> <laughs> These fellas are itching you. Their fingers don't play with them. You know, just leave them alone. Because that's a derogatory statement. It's a slang. Are, are you following? If then you be in Christ... 
So the first thing I got to do, you see, do you realize that if, if the Bible is saying, seek the things that are above, set your mind on things of God, that means whatever you seek, and let me put it this way, the, the, the nicer way I wrote, what you seek affects your position and your privilege. That's a nice way of saying it. It's easier if I read what I actually wrote. Whatever, what you seek affects your sitting position. Where you are sitting from is that position you must see. If you are sitting on your worldly side, you'll be seeking the worldly side. But if you are willing to sit with Christ where he has positioned you, then you'll be asking God for kingly blessings. Amen? Some people cannot handle promotion. Oh, you know, I came from down. I came from down. I started as a laborer. Praise God, bro. You started as nothing. But today when God is lifting you up, you got to handle those changes and bring leadership into your life. You cannot think like a lonely laborer. Now you got to think as a supervisor. It's fun to be doing laborer job when you don't have leadership requirements. But once you come to a supervisory position, it's a, it's a position nobody likes because you have to take control of your staff. You've got to say yes and no for decision making. Nobody loves it. But that's the position of trust. And God is now giving us the position of trust. You say, you are sitting with me. And so what you ask is based on where you are sitting. And that is why when you sit with a backslider, you'll think like them. When you sit with people who have negativity about church, family, about marriage, about relationship, that's all they're going to verbal vomit. That's all that's going to come out of their mouth. Everything that comes out of their mouth is negativity. You said you're getting married. Oh, bro, you know what marriage is going to do for you? Huh? It's going to be a blessing. Of course it's going to be a challenge. But it's going to be a blessing. Three people say amen. <laughs> Am I the only psycho in this room or what? <laughs> it's not fun to be alone, I'm telling you. Is it fun to be together? Mm, yes. <laughs> what you seek after affects your position and your privileges. Now, if you want God to bless you, then you got to set your mind on things above. you got to seek upside from what God wants you to do from a heavenly perspective. In other words, before you get what you want to get, you got to pray. You see, that, that's now different perspective. You've never prayed before. I thought if I want to get something, I've got to do more over time. Yes, but that money can be stolen if you're not getting set it right. So now the Bible is saying, set your mind on things above. So what you're thinking affects you a lot more. That is why negativity and habitual problems that we have, you see, I'm trying to put it in so that you will understand how God works. When you say seek, it's a new language of setting of principles and priorities. When you seek something, principles are added into your life. Priorities are added into your life. And when you're young and you're 16, you're 17, you're 18, 9, I don't care, I'll do whatever. What right or wrong, it doesn't matter to me. So as you got older, you got to matter. If not, you won't know what is right or wrong. You'll be sitting into every wagon and talk about every other nonsense and come home and start affecting the negativity of others is killing your spirit. And they wonder where it came from. Because it did not mind which wagon you are sitting on. Now it does matter to you. Isn't it? Oh, I'm a strong and healthy. I don't mind if you cough on my face. Oh, really? Let's bring you to the tuberculosis department. Let's see whether you mind if they cough on your face. Because these are contagious diseases. Are you following? It does. You do mind. You got to remember, you got to measure it by your vulnerability. Now, seeking will readjust priorities and principles. When you say setting your mind, 
It adjusts your sacrifice, your discipline to achieve. Because you set your mind on something, you see. So when God is using the word seek and set, is readjusting values, priority management, and also your readiness to respond to what you are seeking. It depends on what you are seeking. Some people seek to be a champion, and you find a lot of stories of heroes, people who made it into Paris and the Olympics. They are, you know, it doesn't matter if they are a winner or they are champion, they are waiting for the next Olympics. Because that's what they are given to do. They, they set their mind on winning. They cannot afford to uh, go through negativity. They pay th- co- uh, coaches, mind coaches, mind psychologists to train their mind to think. They got someone to shout and scream because that's how their energy is being focused. Paul is like the coach standing on the sideline and is keep helping us to focus what we are supposed to be doing. Amen. If not, we are all the time talking about what we don't have instead of what we have. Sometimes we think that this Christian relationship with God is just a drive-through. It doesn't make any sense, man. I can drive through anywhere. The first thing I want to remind us, honor your identity in Christ. The Bible says in verse 1, you are raised with Christ. Now, accepting Christ's forgiveness in your heart was the first change. Now, Paul is requiring us to accept this new mind where God is giving to you. This mind has been programmed by what others have said, the circumstances, your background. You come from a gang background, it's all kill and destroy. You come from a gang or dealing with drugs is turf line. Who controls what? There's no value system of life. It's a value system of death. It doesn't matter if you take my drugs and you die. That's business. That's life. So from small, they are trained that way. If the bravest must be willing to die, they think going to prison is having ranks. I just came out rogue. From where? I just served time. Oh, you're a timer, huh? Ranks goes up. You know who is he? So they take it with pride because that's the way they have to be programmed in their mind. Your God is now telling us, change everything about your past, change it. You got to live life instead of dying for it. You understand what I'm saying? It requires a lot of change. Because when I was in the gang, that's how we have been programmed and psycho to think. It doesn't matter if you die in a gang clash, man. And take it with pride, you die for your brothers. Which brother? But my own blood brother, I don't want to talk to him. My own flesh blood brother. I'm willing to die for the fellows who don't even care about what I'm going through. Now Paul is readjusting my mind. He's saying, these are your family now. You got to start seeking things that I got to read for me personally. I got to readjust. Now, I wanted to think about this. Now, it's easy for me to say and for you to believe if you don't have habits and addictions and easy for you to handle this new change. What about those who come from addictions background? They're addicted to this. They're addicted to that. We're talking about, please, how, oh, yeah. The other day, you know, I talked about addiction to someone I was helping and the other person interjected yeah me too I'm addicted to what you what potato chips man this fellow is in the depth of drugs you're talking about potato chips huh right you gotta zip your mouth man I don't know what else to tell you this guy is in the verge of dying through addiction to drugs you know you know what that is Please don't compare this and that together and say, oh, that's all addiction. No, this one is different. Is that fair to say that? That's different. This is self, lust, gluttony, destruction. That one sometimes very helpless. The body chemical mechanism is different. The withdrawal symptoms are different. I've been a counselor in the prison, man. When you see the fellas going through cold turkey treatment, You wish you want to help them by giving them drugs. 
the way they are, as though they are burning in hell, they'll be screaming for two weeks. A pastor friend of mine who had a cold turkey treatment counseling center, these are pastors, but they chain people, no, chain. It's either you are willing to go through their treatment or go to prison and go through cold turkey there. It's sad, but the treatment always works. They change and they become better disciples. And many of them going through their treatment, I'm not saying their chain treatment is right, but I'm saying the treatment we've got focused always get better results. Somebody say amen. Because there was true love there. You're not changing because you're changing for the better. You're changing because someone believes in you. So this level of change, dealing strong with habits, problems in your mind, addictions. And sometimes to add on to the injury, if you have negative emotions, it's going to oil these habits more and more. Why must I change? Nobody loves me. Why must I change? Nobody cares for me anyways. So these emotions, when it's negative, it will oil these habits. They keep doing what you're doing. Nobody loves you anyway. So the first area when you set your mind and seek after things above, even though nobody loves me, there is a God who died for me. His love is sufficient. The change of emotions must change first before you can change the occupancy of your mind. So if there is one thing I need this morning, is God to fill me up with the love he carries for me. How much does he love me? Go to the river and take as much as you want. I said, but I, I need it whole day. Then whole day worship if you want to do that, bro. Some of us have done that, you know, until you are satisfied the whole well, the dry well that you had has been filled. Now we don't wait until it goes empty. We just measure it. The moment it's going, decreasing, go back to the river and fill it up. Are you, are you with me? Sometimes when I'm praying and I'm ministering to God, it's easier for me to just one hour, it, it fills up. But when I go through long-term fasting and I, when, when I go through a long-term of preaching schedules, 15 sessions and 12 sessions or one whole month of preaching in missions, I'm dried and like an empty log, I'm done. Then when I go back home and wait before God, now it requires a longer time of praying, sometimes three days or even one week, to fill up my empty tank. It's not just that one hour of worship now it requires longer time because I used up everything I had in that conference in praying for people day and night because when you go into the mission field, man, they will suck you dry. It's gone. Three times a day you will be ministering, you are praying. There's no time to even remember what you ate for lunch. Because it's all being used up. And when we go in the mission field, it's not this luxury transport provided. We walk sometimes for miles to get into a village to preach. You don't have those luxuries. You've got to think about the cobra. You've got to think about the disease-spreading mosquitoes. You can think about night, what other crawl things that will come. You know, where's the luxury three-star hotel? Yes, we'll buy you the stars. You put anywhere you want. That, that's what mission feel is. I mean, praise God, today we have all the blessings, you know. And I want to tell you this. I want to give you some empowering thoughts to think about. Are you dealing with negativity all your life? And are you choosing negativity as a pet? Some people just love it, man. Because they have built their identity on negativity. Because positive, they change. Ah, no, nah, that's not for me. When I'm positive, nobody comes towards me. When I'm negative, I can build my sorrow stories and take you hostage and come and sit with me. You gotta talk to me. They go, oh. Husbands, you know, wives sometimes use that trick, man. The only way to get the husband to see himself, you know what I feel? Oh, really? Tell me. That's it. You're there sitting for an hour. Going through the same track. <laughs> because that's the only track they can play. I thought this was like 35 years ago. Yeah. I knew. Oh man, I'm telling you, I went to 
counsel a lady, she was about committing suicide. He said, Pastor, you've got to come to the house. You've got to talk to this lady. And they were so smart, they didn't want to tell me who. I went to the house, it was an 85-year-old lady. I want to commit suicide. Yeah, you should, maybe. Nobody cares, right? You're 85. <laughs> How can you talk to my grandmother? No, you make it sound like she's a newborn babe. Okay, good. You know, it was a fun time we were talking. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying kill yourself in 85. I'm not saying that. It was a joke. It was, she was joking, I was joking, all right. Now I said, tell me what's the real problem. Are you ready for this problem? I want to know that you want to know. If not, I'll skip. Okay. She's 85. So I said, Auntie, Grandma, what is your real problem? Why do you want to kill yourself? I'm thinking of my husband. Okay. Where's your husband? He's been kidnapped. Okay. By who? By the Japs. What? When? 1945. <laughs> what do you think I should do? I said, you've got to go to heaven to see him. I don't know what else to tell her. Come on. You know how many years ago? 40 years ago. I mean, it's okay to cry. But it's not okay to cry as though you got married yesterday. Come on. You've been talking about it for 40 years. That's the only way your grandchildren will listen to you. You got to get out of the, I cannot, it's so I can give you tissue paper. <laughs> I cannot call the Japanese embassy finding out for you. You know, they'll shoot me probably. <laughs> you may think this is funny, but for some people it's real. But sometimes when you live in that past of yours, anything, you know, well, it was yesterday. Oh, it was a month ago. Oh, it was a year ago. There is always a reasonable time to talk about the past and a reasonable time to get out of the past. If not, even when you're 90 years old, you're going to talk about this. Now, sometimes I'm not really making joke about this. I've been a Singaporean. I, I am a Singaporean. I've ministered to families who have lost their loved one during Japanese war. Husbands who have been lost. Many of the parents from India, the, the ladies who lost their husbands, unjustly arrested by the British, deported over to various Asian countries without the family's knowledge. The husbands were deported for nonsense crimes, like on the street, you, you said something. You, for example, speeding when you're not, arrested, thrown into prison, but they were deported to Asian countries to work on the railroads to set up their roads and stuff like that and their husbands did not come back. During the Japanese occupation in Singapore, many Chinese were brought out to the villagers or to the plantations and they were killed there. They did not come back. You'll have a lot of people affected in their emotions. Some of them were remarried because they had many children. They, they don't know what else to do. They gave away their kids because there's too many they cannot feed. Rather than holding on, they gave away. You know, those kind of trauma people went through are real. I thank God. I went into real counseling with those people. Real problems. And then when you talk about the young people today, you don't have real problems when you created one. If you say you are depressed, it's a luxury to be depressed. If you're working out on the field, you don't have time to be depressed, bro. You'll be working hard to get things done. You don't have time to feel sad. You'll be needing to put food on the table. In fact, that hard work is going to re-energize your mental performance. Are you following? I'm not putting down depression. I'm, I'm qualified as a counselor to talk about those things. But there are legitimate depression. There are demonic depression. There are self-made depression. And there are also clinical depression. Today I want to talk about the mind. The mind, when it's bad and negative and destructive habits, listen carefully. I wrote this line. I want you to listen carefully now. Bad, negative, destructive habits as a way to bring you to places where you don't want to go. Because your mind is generating pathways. Your heart says, I don't want to go there. 
But because of the negativity, it will show you a path where you don't want to go. I'll show you a scripture because as the Holy Spirit shows me, you know, Proverbs chapter 7. Let's go to verse 7, 8. Verse 7 and 8. Let's go to Proverbs, the book of Proverbs chapter 7. I pray that this morning God will give you a path to show your way out. Somebody say amen. amen. The book of Proverbs chapter 7. Now I can quote every other book to show you. I mean I can quote other books if I want to. But the Bible is a book that sets you free. Other books that I will quote is just an affirmation of another counselor. He said it. That book wrote about habits and they said that. Another book talked about destructive patterns. They said this. Good. There are good information. But the word of God sets you free. Whereas the other books doesn't set you free. It gives you knowledge. There are people who quote my books. Great. Gives you knowledge. The guy said it. But when you quote the Bible, God sets you free. Amen. The Bible says, I have seen among the simple and I perceive among the youth a young man lacking sense. And verse 8, passing along the street near her corner. Now pay attention. This fellow lacks sense. That means he's stupid. He just lacks sense. What he did? He was walking to a street near this girl's corner. Taking the road to a house. Who is this girl? Verse 9. In the twilight, in the evening, at the time of night and darkness. I just, for the sake of who is this woman? Verse 10. And behold, the woman meets him dressed as a prostitute, willy of heart. She is loud and wavered and a feed. Do not stay at home. So you know now she's walking, or this guy, young man, walking towards a place where he shouldn't be going, or he doesn't want to go, but he's willing to go through. Habits that has formed over time. A couple of things I want to tell you. He has a habit. He doesn't want to go to a house, but he's still walking in that direction. Negativity. Oh, you know, she doesn't ask me who I am. Yeah, of course, she wants the money, bro. She's willing to talk about it. And so when there is negativity, it will lead you to places you don't want to go. You'll get stuck. And then you wonder why you went there. Because that emotion brought you to that place. There are a couple of things to remember, and I want to give you some points. Is that okay? Number one, just because you are simple doesn't mean you are excluded from temptation or satanic attacks. There are people who always excuse themselves. You know, pastor, I'm just a simple guy. So what? You think you're exempted? Just because you say you're simple? Does it excuse you? You can do anything? And you can tell the police or tell people you heard, I'm just a simple guy. Sorry. Sorry. Take responsibility even though you're simple. You think I'm a simple guy from a farming village? You get to get free things in the gas station? We got to pay. But we tend to excuse yourself every time we get into problem. We don't want to take responsibility. And we say, oh, but you know, I'm just a simple guy, you know. Okay, after you finish crying, let's work on it again. Are you following because sometimes we handle relationship, we find it difficult to handle it because when they create problem, they create it like they are the masters of the universe. And when they are caught and it starts breaking down, they cry like a baby and say, I'm simple, you know. You still have to take responsibility to what you created. Are you following? If you don't believe that theory, then there is no reason why we are correcting our children when they do wrong things. It's a child. Why are you even speaking for one hour? You know what? I, come and sit here. Come and sit down. I want to tell you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's a child for heaven's sake. You're speaking to a child. Sometimes you put a mirror. You look like a child when you're talking to a child. It's not going to remember as much. So that because you are simple, it doesn't mean Satan let you go. The fact there are lacking sense and not God's word you become a candidate. That's number one. Number two, 
Look at the habits if you are not willing to change. When bad habits are not changed, it always leads you to another direction where you will feel so powerless and become a victim. Where where else Jesus, when you walk in his path, you will be empowered to overcome. Not powerless. Powerful in Christ. That's the difference, you see. And number third one, I want to give you this point, that you will understand how it works. I want you to understand in verse, um, verse 7, verse 8, verse 9. Go to verse 9. I want you to pay attention. Another point to keep in mind. In the twilight in the evening and the time of night in darkness. You know, sin, demons, and darkness all go together. Demons work better in the night. Whenever there is darkness and secrecy, moles grow. When they want to commit sin and they want to do stuff and they want anybody to know, they choose darkness and the night. And so for those who are struggling with habits or destructive habits, I want you to pay attention whenever you are alone or whenever in the night or darkness, have some guy, some brother, some sister to take some accountable time whenever you're in the dark. What do people do? Some people pay sex talkers. Just to pay so they will talk to you. I'll be amazed, you know. They don't want to talk to people who make sense. They want people to nurture their nonsense. And you got to pay money for it. There are people who are willing to go online like a company. They are making money out of your nonsense. Are you, are you with me? Because if you want to make sense of that nonsense situation... You'll talk to a counselor, you talk to a child of God, they'll show you a way out. Whereas this paid money will keep you inside further and further, nurturing that pain so they'll be, become dependent on them. And why do many do that? When you feel in the night. It's not fun. And I'm talking about serious counselling stuff. I remember one guy came to me for counselling. He wanted to burn his house down. Why? Because he was involved in sex addiction, porn addiction online, and then he was involved in gambling addiction right in the room. He will not come out of the room for two weeks in a row. Can you imagine? Doesn't take a shower. He throws his waste out of the apartment and he throws it down. Catches up in the plastic bags. Afraid that if he comes out of the room, he will lose money. Demons entertains him and tortures his soul. All kinds of stuff. I mean, because kids are sitting here, so there are things that I don't want to say. Real problems when they come to counseling. And when his mother bangs the door for lunch, to come out to take a shower, a couple of times he went down and Went to the, bought a can of kerosene to burn the house down if you call me for dinner again. Police have shown up many times in the house. And they wanted a Christian counselor to help him. And I handled that for about a month. He was okay for a while and the demons come back. Why? Because it's not about the mind, it's cleaning up the room as well. Demons get attached to familiar things in your house, familiar things in your room, familiar photos that remind you of the past, things you leave behind by the past relationship to remind you of what? Pain? So when you want to overcome pain, you got to get rid of everything that reminds you of pain. Blouse, shirt, pants, t-shirt, anything that gives, that are given, that attach to death and pain, Get to get out. The whole house got to change in order for light to come in. Are you following? Counseling is easier sitting inside the room, but pastoral counselors, they visit their house and they smell demonic effect and works. Are you following? So demonic deliverance requires this kind of change, you see. So I'm not speaking from an easy platform. Pastor, it's so easy for you to speak. Bro, 
I want you to take a journey with me and do what I've done. Then you'll know whether it's easy to speak or not. It carries weight. The words that I speak from this pulpit carries weight. Because you have done this kind of works. So I'm not taking it easy when I say these things. It's painful. You need to figure out what level of area of help you need to overcome those challenges. So when Paul said, set your mind on things above, it is not as easy for some, you see. Why? There are demonic powers that's holding your mind down in hostage. It pulls you down with pain. If Christ was Lord, then how come my mother died? Because that was a trauma they have experienced, you see. If Jesus was Lord, then how come my child died? Do you know there are no answers in the human way speaking? Sometimes we ask for human answers when only God can give you that answer. No human can. So when Paul says, set your minds on things above, you've got to deal with these habits. You've got to deal with demonic structures that is built because of the negativity. That's not fun. Demons and sin grows like a mole in darkness. As long as there is no fresh air coming in, moles grow. Huh? You don't have the fresh wind of the Holy Spirit coming and touching your heart and your life and your mind, moles will grow. I know how to worship God. No, when you worship in the community, it brings a fresh air. It brings a fresh wind because someone else is bringing a fresh direction in worship, not your same old song that's not helping you anymore. Are you following? That is why we need a community. I know how to pray myself. Of course. But you're already showing a sign that your prayer is not helping you. There is something about praying by self to self and there is something different praying to God. This challenge, chapter 3, verse 1. We are still in verse 1. Look at that. It's not as easy for some. You got to walk through the challenge. The younger you are, the earlier you build your family, it will be a stage of just different challenge, like challenge number one, challenge two, every week, every day. But it's a season where you can jump higher and stronger without getting tired. You tell to a 75, oh sorry, not Larry, not you. Accept you. Okay? Accept you. Please don't take it personal. Not you. You tell to a 95 year old, how's that? To jump through five hurdles and they need to rest for a week. But when you are 20 men, jumping through five hurdles every day is a hobby. So you are in a zone of your life where you can overcome anything, jump through anything, and still exhibit the joy of the Lord. Amen? I want you to know you are an overcomer. And think about it differently. First of all, I said number one, Honor your position that God has given you. And I want to finish with number two because we really can't go any further from here, man. Number two is verse two that we talk about. Change and make effort to change your thought patterns. <laughs> if you came from a background in life where all that you heard is you are a nobody and you become nobody, you'll die, you'll never make it in life, you'll never prosper, you'll never have enough, Forever you will be in addiction. Forever you will be in this destructive pattern. Forever you will be borrowing money. You will always live on credit. If that's all you want to keep believing, when you come out, oh, you know, we come from the back skirts, inner city. That's all you're going to be. You'll die in the inner city. If that's all you allow your mind to program you, then t- this morning is your day of deliverance. You realize that you will stay there if you want to. If you want to come out, you'll work hard. Money is a slave to anybody who's willing to work for it. Do you understand? Money is not magic. And I'm not talking about casino money, bro. I'm talking about hard work money. You don't build your life on one stroke of luck, bro. You you build your life on hard work and learning how to come up in life. And that money will stay with you. Isn't it? And that's what the Bible says here. 
You've got to learn how to handle that change of thought patterns. You can have a million dollars and you have a very poor mind of managing, you lose it any time. Because it's really not that difficult to spend a million dollars today, isn't it? It's not really that difficult. You order one house that is a million, it's gone. One signature, the money is gone. It's not that difficult. Go Las, uh, uh, Las, uh, Las Vegas, Las Vegas, how do you say that? And you lose it in a day, if you like. It's not difficult. It's not an Einstein. What I do with the money? Give it to me. I'll show you. <laughs> but if you want to make that money work for you, that's hard work. And so here, I've got to change my thought patterns. How do I do that? I set my mind on things that are above, which I draw from God. Not on things that are on earth. I draw it from God. My father, my mother told me, many times when he was working as a postman, and those days are big deal because it's a government job, it's a federal job. You'll be set up for life, at least in pension, medical, you know. And those days they did not have motorcycle. I'm talking about 1950s, man. They, they have to press on bicycles up and down the hills. And so my father developed a lot of pain. Well, he's had a lot of drinking buddies. So they'll borrow money and get my father to sign as a guarantor because this guy is a civil servant, right? People will give loan because he's a, how much was his salary? $100 a month. He was willing to sign for people who are known not to pay back. My mother will say sometimes it doesn't come in the night and he will go to the police station to report but he'll be there in the jail. Why? Because someone he guaranteed for did not pay the money and he doesn't have the money and so they'll be in prison for a day until someone has to bail out. My mother will tell all these stories to me. So when I accepted Christ, one of the things I cry out to God is to give me wisdom. How to handle, who to sign for, who to be guaranteed, who is not. And it's funny, when people want to borrow money and they want someone to be guaranteed, they always choose a pastor. Why? Because your position is a position of trust. Number two, a pastor will never say no. He's fool enough to always say yes. <laughs> because this fellow is too naive and believing into everybody. He believes they are redeemed state instead of their present state. <laughs> In resurrection, you'll be okay. Yeah, who cares, bro? After that, you're dead anyway. <laughs> so then I have to read the book of Proverbs and say, God, give me wisdom. Who to sign and who not to sign. I don't want to end up in jail and lose the testimony. When to borrow money and when not to. When, how to save and how not to. Are you with me? Where did that wisdom come from? From that above. Which book did I use? A very old book. Did I go for any other seminar? No, I did not. Free seminar from the Lord. Use the Bible first. What about David Ramsey? <laughs> That's about $3,000, bro. This one is free. It's funny how people are willing to save for that, but this one free they don't want. Because it starts with God, you see. It starts with God. And it's free. Somebody say, Amen. It's free. How do I understand? No, the Holy Spirit will apply it to you. Don't worry. I'm not good in English. The Holy Spirit has this way to make you understand whether it's English or Chinese or Japanese or whatever not. The Holy Spirit will teach you. That's God's word. It will be difficult to bring changes on your own without the Holy Spirit. I want to tell you the truth before we finish it up. Before knowing the truth, his satanic powers were holding you captive breaks your power to change. You're always thinking, I cannot. I don't have this power. I'm in bondage. You'll never have the power to say no in the past. You don't have the power to break these destructive patterns. I've involved in counseling among the drug addicts. You don't want to come out because, you know, if I don't buy, that fellow's family will suffer. What? 
because his wife is dependent on him as a pusher. All these sad patterns of emotional tanglement comes into their mind and they cannot set themselves free. I cannot change I because I don't want to be a snitch because if I do, then everybody will get caught. Either I get caught or I die outside, whichever way. I'm talking about serious stuff, man. When I came out from the gangs, I said the same thing. I didn't snitch out on anybody. I just walked away from the group. And it took me two years to be free. Two years of not creating any problem. Two years of the Holy Spirit working through. Instead of God helping me, protecting me, God was changing their life. Somebody say, Amen. My prayer was powerful enough for a 15-year-old and a half. Their lives were changed. Their life was changing one by one until they, God gave them the heart to just let me go and walk away free. I prayed day and night, wept and cried and fasted. I didn't have money. My currency was my prayer and my time. And God <coughs> can do that for you today. Somebody say amen. amen. There are destructive thought patterns, mood swings, depression. Those days when you say addiction is drugs, but today everyday language addiction can just be gaming. One young boy, 15-year-old boy, he took the keyboard, you know, the computer keyboard. He took and smacked his mom in the rage of anger. Instead of studying for school exam, when the mother took the, uh, the keyboard and hid it away from playing, in that one-minute rage of anger, he smacked her so many times, he didn't realize her skull broke and she died right in front of his eyes in the kitchen. In Singapore, that's capital punishment, you know. But he went into juvenile counseling. And my professor was the court-appointed counselor to mitigate because he didn't expect that to happen. Because in the rage, that force and the angle, the boy cried and cried, thinking about his mother. All that because of King. Because you took away something I love. What they did not know is demonic spirits were empowering that addiction. That brings anger, rage. Man, you can buy a keyboard hundred times if you like. Cannot get a mother back, you see. We don't realize. What I mean, but I speak, I'm not saying it easy. I'm saying of a lot of pain when I speak sometimes, you know. So for those who are watching online, if you have your children addicted to all these games, help them out to grow out of it. And you know the first thing they can help out? Is prayer. Pray for them, fast for them. There are people who are addicted to online shopping. Texting to anybody and everybody. Spreading false rumors. Just their pastime. Or keep unclean materials or just don't take a shower. It's just a habit that builds up. Over time, God can set you free in the name of Jesus. Some people just like a disorderly home. It's all messed up when you go in. Because demons bring the disorderliness. Their mind is not fragmented. It's just broken every way. They don't want to put people into order anymore. They hate orderliness. It's not you. It's demonic powers at work. But God has the power to set you free. Amen. Amen. There's one more point and we're going to wrap it up, okay? Are you being blessed? You know, when you set your mind on things above, God is able to show you His directions for your life. I want to finish up with one point that verse 3 says, For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Your life is hidden in Christ. It's not exposed by the devil anymore. Why are you thinking it's exposed? Because you are living there. Your mind is still living there. God has set you free, but your life is still there below. You got to come out. Some people have spoken to me when they came out and accepted Jesus. You know, pastor, I've done black magic for people. 
and certain things have done is long-term black magics that the entire life will die one by one. Another family. What, are, what happens to that? Must I go and undo? No, there's nothing to undo. When you go to Jesus, He sets you free. He not only sets you free, He sets that black magic free, breaks that curse that's going to come on another person. You know, that's what God does. I've seen God doing that before. Because they feel responsible for things they have done to others and they don't know. They have even forgotten why. Some people do it in anger, moments of anger, betrayal. And they do these things, company to fail, jealousy, marriages to broke up, break up. They'll get money. They're jealous of a nice marriage and they'll send curses against. When you come before Jesus, He not only sets you free and give you a new life, He sets every other pattern, chain of destruction free in Jesus' name. In order to tell you the truth, it is because of you accepting Christ, the others will see the light of Christ. That's the truth. I want to think about one thing. God places each one of us in his life, in his heart. You are hidden in his heart. This morning I want you to encourage you and give you one power statement. Are you ready? You got to tell Satan, I command you to take your hands off. Name anything you want to fill in the blank. It's your heart, it's your mind. And I remember years ago when, when I was doing an evangelistic meeting, the husband was getting involved in prostitution. The husband was, i tell you this funny thing. You'll know how real these stories are. I was praying for this family, the husband. He's married to this beautiful wife, he has children. But he did not come out of a school time bondage. When he was in school, in his teenage years, he will disturb, uh, I don't know how, what crime is that in America, I don't know how to say it. He will just whistle at other school girls, get their numbers, go for a date, sleep with them for a, one night, and the story keeps going. How do you say that? What kind of sexual harassment, whatever you can throw into that category. Now, this fellow is 30-something, married. He still does that, goes to school after school, waits for the girls to come. And some of these girls fall in love with him for a day. How? Black magics are involved. When they exchange numbers, when they touch the paper, black magics are involved. Can you imagine that kind of a marriage? And this lady was a believer praying that God will set her husband free. And guess what, when I helped her to pray, and I'm, have, this story that I'm telling you is 29 years old. There are many other stories, but sometimes just remember the worst case scenario. She said, God, I command you, I mean, not God, devil, I command you to take your hands off from my husband's sexual organs. That was how straight it was. Because demonic spirits will hold our body parts under bondage. Your heart will be in Christ, but your body parts can be under bondage. So mind, eyes, tongue, ears, heart, liver, diseases, the organs can be under bondage. Don't ask me, Pastor, how? I cannot dis- explain to you. That is why we need deliverance in the multi-layers of our life. You cannot be praising God today and then go back home and tear down your family piece by piece with your tongue. Set your tongue free in the name of Jesus. Learn to bless for once. Speak the good word. And so today can we stand up together and ask the Lord. Before we pray, I'm going to show you one scripture for us to be blessed. Then lift up your hands and you don't have to say out loud. We can say in your heart, Satan, I command you to take your hands off, fill in the blanks, okay? Let's go, let's pray. Say it in your heart. You don't have to say, I don't want anybody to hear what you're saying. Father, I pray God as they are praying in the name of Jesus, let faith fill this sanctuary. For those who are watching online, let faith 
come through the channels and the waves and touch them where they are praying for. I pray God as they command demonic powers to take their hands off. Let the angels of God go and occupy their emptiness. They are running for love. Let God's love fill that empty heart. They feel that their mind will be empty without those drugs, without those drinks, without those pills, without the replacement addictions. We pray in the name of Jesus. Replace it with hope. We play, replace with healing. Replace with a hope for the tomorrow. Replace with health, with joy. No more thinking about death, but thinking about life. No more thinking of losing, thinking about winning. I pray in the name of Jesus that the power of the Holy Spirit will come upon them. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now before we close this, I want to read and bless you with a scripture, Psalms chapter 25, verse 8 to 13. You know what happens when you commit your heart to God? You know what happens when Jesus comes and takes control of you as your father, your mother, your brother, your coach? Something happens. I want to tell you what, as I'm reading, please keep changing the next verse, okay? Good and upright is the Lord, therefore He instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right. He teaches the humble His way. All the path of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness. For those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt. For it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Him he will instruct in the way that God would choose. Oh, sorry. Him he will instruct in the way that he should choose. In other words... Whichever direction you are choosing, God will give you that instruction. Verse 13, the last verse. His soul shall abide in well-being. Are you ready for the blessing? You know what's the greatest joy? God not just set you free for now. He's planning to bless your offspring. That I cannot even imagine. You can be single, you know. But he's thinking about your offspring. So when He blessed you and set your mind free today, He wants your children to be free. He doesn't want your children to experience what you went through in your childhood in order for God to set your children unborn. He has to change your mind today. Probably you came from a family that was angry and cursing away, but He wants your children to grow up in an environment of love, lesson. Hope. The only way God can do that is to touch you today. Perhaps, far fetched for me to say that, perhaps it's a prayer and a cry of an unborn child. God, I want to be born in a house, not to be cursed or thrown away, not to be abandoned or aborted. Perhaps it's a prayer. Of an unborn child, send me into a house where I can be nurtured. Therefore, God has to change the parent to bless that child. The only way it's going to be is that God will lead you in His path, in His ways. There's two challenges that God has placed. Number one, seek things which are above. Number two, set your mind on things of God. Father, I want to thank you for my brothers and my sisters this morning. I want to thank you for the families that have visited us this morning. For those who are watching online. Father, if they have a child, family member who are deep into drugs and addiction or doing time right now, they don't have any hope for tomorrow. They are involved in gangs or hardcore. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus. Let the angels of God go and minister to them and bring the change. They could be in prison, but God, the Bible says, the book of Acts, angels can go through and appear to them and change them and set them free in the name of Jesus. Lord, they could be high, but there is 
Your love is much more higher. Let them be set free in the midst of their highness. Because you have a power to penetrate in a way which we will never understand. Those drug addicts, they don't know when they're going to die because they just want the high. But God, you have the power to stop them there. And I pray and intercede for those whose brothers and sisters are involved. I pray for those families whose children are in jail. I pray for moms and dads who are addicted to alcohol, who has not been set free now. I pray for husbands and wives, God, who has not been free. This morning we pray, we send forth an SOS. We need your help, oh God. We need your help for our families. We need your help, Lord, for our children. We need your help. Set the captives free. We need your help to bring joy back to the household. We need your help to bring light in the midst of darkness. Set our families free. Show us this pathway. And I pray, Father, that your presence will continue to be here. Minister to your children. We thank you and honor you for the word this morning. Your word always works. We pray, God, that the love of God our Father, redemption of Jesus the Son, and the power of the Holy Spirit will continue to be upon us and our children today and tomorrow and forevermore till we meet again in Christ Jesus. Amen.